In this world, there are a lot of things that people put their faith in. Money, a job, a house, family, plans, pets, sports teams, the next revolutionary diet. But where has that led us? Anxiety, confusion, financial stress, relational discord, apathy towards God. But this isn't the way it's supposed to be, no. What if in our day and time, God is calling us to rise up and renew our zeal, our passion, and our genuine worship for Him while living in the midst of a faithless world? Hey, church. Good morning. You ready for this week of weather? It's going to be awesome. No? Okay. All right. Well, I'm excited about it. Uh, All right. So... Let's go back in the past, or maybe some of you for in the future. Um, you remember do go, doing driver's education class? Driver's ed? Driver's ed? Give me, a, give me a hand up if you did driver's ed. All right, look around. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Look around. Anybody who has their hand down, watch out for them on the road, okay? All right. Okay. JK. LOL. Uh, maybe. We'll see. Um, so in Waynedale, I went to this, there was like a little storefront that had uh, the driver's education classes. And I, I remember, like, you know, I, I obey the traffic laws and stuff, but I don't remember all of the actual lessons, like the moments that they were teaching. You can remember some stuff that someone taught you, but you don't always remember the actual lesson, right? So, but I remember that there was this moment in time we got to the class, and, and, and they wanted to make sure that whatever they were about to say was going to be etched into our souls, okay? So they put on some videos, and on these videos, uh, there was some defining moments for people's lives. They, they made some, some decisions, and, and it was not good. Uh, they were advising us to not do what these people on the screen were doing. You see, there's this thing on some roads where it has these things that kind of come down, right? And there's, there's these big trains that go on these railroad tracks, and sometimes right? Sometimes you are in a rush to get to your hair appointment or whatever it is, right? You're just in a rush to get to the school or to work. And so some people, because they were in a rush, they didn't want to wait behind these nice red and white or whatever color they are uh, things, these arms, they decided they want to go around and try and get through. And here was the lesson that I remember etched into my soul is you don't want to play chicken with the train. Because here's what happened every time. The train always won. Right? And if you didn't know that, you're welcome, all right? Like, and it wasn't always, you know, the, the one with the arms, but they would have the blinking lights and the train, you know, they, they make the horn go. And, and, and so, like, people would try and get past the train, and every time it just wouldn't work. And it was not good. And they wanted us as teenagers who are about to be like operating these big chunks of metal that can go at high speeds. They wanted us to understand that you are not invincible, right? And, and so like they, the, we, we probably have, uh, if we tracked our lives, we have moments like that where there's some important lessons we need to learn. And, and if, we, if we receive them and we honor them and we live in light of them, then, then we're good. But there's these defining moments that sometimes we miss and, and we didn't do the thing that we know we were supposed to do. We tried to go in the railroad crossing and avoid the train and it didn't work out. You know, sometimes we make some decisions that head to disaster. And, and that's what the Israelites, these, these priests, and as we'll find out as we continue this, this, this book, uh, the whole of the Israelites, this is what they were, they were experiencing. Like they, God had a lesson for them that he wanted them to understand and be taught and for them to live in light of. But for some reason, they were choosing the path that was not good for them. And all of us probably have moments like that, like where we could just go back to experiences of our own. We could just go back and we're like, yep, that decision, dumb. That decision, oh, that wasn't good. And we just start to see the, the, the trail of, of destruction that led to that moment where we just asked ourselves, how did we get here? Or we've seen family members or friends and they, they made some decisions. They didn't heed the lessons that they had learned about life and about wisdom and they ended up in the spot that they never planned on being, 
because they didn't heed the lesson that they were supposed to learn. And so God is doing this with these priests. As we uh, looked at last week, if you were with us, we, we saw that God was speaking right now to these priests in these passages uh, who, were, who were set apart to be the people who would pronounce blessings from God to the people. They were mediating between God and the people. They were administering the sacrifices in the Mosaic law. So they would bring these, these animals and they would sacrifice them uh, as a sin offering, a burnt offering to God to worship him, but they were not honoring God with what they were doing. They were not honoring him with their lives. They were doing the spiritual eye rolling uh, toward God and they were just kind of doing, going through the motions, but they grew apathetic. And, and so last week we saw that uh, the priests, like the, they, these were like the leaders of Israel and, and all this, but we saw that now because of Jesus, we as followers of Jesus have been made into a royal priesthood. So this conversation that God is having between these priests in the fifth century BC and Israel actually has some relevance to us here in the 21st century here right where we are in Bluffton because we have been made into a royal priesthood. So uh, we're gonna open up scripture. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn it to Ma Malachi chapter two. Uh, if anyone asks you what you're going through in church, what you guys are studying, you can tell them we're going through the book of Malachi, you know, and see what they do. They're like, what, huh? They're like, yeah, it's in there. And he's like, it's Malachi, it's fine. We like to have fun at FCC. Uh, Malachi chapter two, I mean, Malachi chapter two. Uh, this is where we're gonna start, verse one is what God is saying to these priests through the messenger named Malachi. Verse two, or verse one, Malachi chapter two. Therefore, this decree is for you priests. If you don't listen, if you don't take it to heart to honor my name, says the Lord of armies, I will send a curse among you and I will curse your blessings. In fact, I have already begun to curse them because you are not taking it to heart. If you don't listen, if you don't take it to heart, any, any parents ever said that? If you don't listen, right? You're hearing my voice, but you're not listening. Uh, those of us who are rebellious as kids, you've, said, you've had people say that to you. If you don't listen, if you don't take it to heart. You see, the, the Israelites in the fifth century, they would have understood when he says heart, they would have understood this as the command center of our lives, this is the place where all the knowledge, all the wisdom, all of the decisions, all the moments of decision, it's all there. It's all right there in your guts, in your heart. And, and he's saying, hey, if you don't listen to me right now, what I've been saying, if you don't listen, if you don't take it to heart, then, then your blessings that you pronounce on people are not gonna be blessings anymore. They're gonna be curses. And you're already starting to see this in your life. And so this is like a serious thing between God and these priests. It'd be like this, it'd be like this. So like you're on a plane, all right? You're on a plane and, and some of you are already nervous, all right? It's fine, all right? But you're on a plane and you know, on an airplane, when you're in the air, you want what? You want an airplane pilot in the cockpit, right? That's helpful stuff. Okay, let's just say for the sake of our imaginations that the airplane pilot is hanging out in coach with all of us peasants in the back, eating some peanuts, some Cracker Jacks, sipping on a Coke. It's the right person in the wrong place. Why? Because if that pilot is still back there, and I know we got some autopilot and stuff, but you know, ignore that. Uh, if he's hanging out back there, guess what's happening for us on the plane? It's going down, destruction. Amen, because eventually we're gonna run out of gas. Not gonna be good, right? Even if we got autopilot. So there, for those of you who are saying, oh, we got autopilot, uh, yeah, in your face. <laughs> in the same way, God's saying, hey, I've got a lesson for you. I've got something for you. But if you got the right information in the wrong place, it's like having the right pilot in the wrong place, not in the cockpit. Because if God's spirit and his wisdom is not in your heart, in your command center, you're not even gonna know when you got off track. You'll hit the ground and you wouldn't even know what happened. That's what he's saying. You gotta get this. You can't just hear me. You can't just know this because the priests knew the truth. They knew what God expected. They knew the stuff, right? And for a lot of us, a lot of us grew up in church. A lot of you grew up in church. You, you've been following Jesus for a while, 
Like you know all the right answers in Sunday school. You, you know, you can just say Jesus. That's the answer, right? But for some reason, right, even though we know the right information, for some of us, that information's not gotten to the right place. And that's what God's saying to these priests is, hey, you've got to take this to heart. It's got to change everything about you. It's got to change your decisions. It's got to change the way you look at people. It's got to change everything about you. It's got to change your heart. You've got to get this right information into your heart. You see, these priests, they were used to pronouncing blessing o- blessings over people. Some of us uh, in this room, we've got the gift of our opinion, right? We're experts on our own opinion. Amen. Yeah, like, hey, I'm an expert on that. Uh, And some of us, like, not only are we experts on our opinion, but we are very much uh, benevolent in giving our opinion, right? Very benevolent like that. I'm just a giver, you know, it's all good. Um, And so, like, one sign of spiritual maturity is being able to uh, not just give your opinion, but, like, be able to give God's wisdom to someone, right? Like, you want people around you who will give God's wisdom. You want to be able to give God's wisdom. You want to be a person who is able to give God's wisdom to people in certain situations, But a greater sign of spiritual maturity is not necessarily giving spiritual wisdom from God, but it's receiving spiritual wisdom of God from people and from God. There's a difference, right? There's a posture of like, let me tell you that's different than let me receive from you. Like some of us, right, we, we are very much givers of our teachings, givers of scripture, givers of accountability, but we don't receive it very well. Some of us are very generous. We give gifts to people, but we don't receive them very well. We're really good at loving people, but we don't receive love. We're good at giving correction to people, but we don't receive correction very well. And the, the greatest sign of spiritual maturity for those of us who are willing to, to follow him is to receive God's correction, either directly from his voice, like these Israelites are experiencing through Malachi, or from someone else. Because if you look around, for those of us who follow Jesus, we're royal priesthood, we're priests, so we pronounce blessings on each other, and we give, give each other guidance in the name of Jesus by his word. And so sometimes, many times, we have to be willing to receive correction. And let's just be honest, that's a hard thing to do because it causes us to be humble. Humble. And so he's saying, hey, you gotta humble yourself and listen to me because you are missing it and I'm trying to help you. Remember, the, the whole book of Malachi is, is threaded and, found, and founded upon the foundation of the fact that God loves them and he loves us. So like, this is a hard passage because he's rebuking them. We're gonna get to that in a minute. He's saying your blessings are gonna be curses. Why? Because your character is not aligned up with your competence. You might be able to uh, have the skills of teaching, but for some reason you've allowed your character to slip. And so your blessing, when you pronounce that, it's not gonna be a blessing, it's gonna be a curse. And so he goes on in verse three, Malachi chapter two, verse three. Look, I'm going to rebuke your descendants and get this. I will spread animal waste over your faces. You let that sink in? <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't want that to get in your pores. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> the waste from your festival sacrifices. And you will be taken away with it. Then, we, then you will know that I sent you this decree so that my covenant with Levi may continue says the Lord of armies. Some of y'all just opened up the Bible app for the first time in like three months just to see if that's actually in there. <laughs> it is, I promise. It ain't, it ain't for me. Uh, look, I'm going to rebuke your decision. I'll spread animal. See, God, when God's preaching a sermon and he's doing a sermon illustration, he goes all in, y'all. He goes all in. <laughs> if I use that sermon illustration, y'all would be looking at me like, cra- y'all crazy. Uh, it's God. That's That's him. I'm going to rebuke your descendants. I will spread animal waste over your faces. So like, all right, verse three, look, I'm going to rebuke your descendants. What is he saying? Well, first off, the illustration of I'm going to spread animal waste over your faces, he's making a point and a very graphic point, but he's making the point, and that is this, that as priests, you are supposed to be set apart and clean before God. But when you got animal waste on your face, 
Let's just be honest, spiritually and physically, you ain't clean, right? Amen, that's gonna stink for a while, right? And God is saying, hey, because you are not honoring my name, you are gonna be disqualified from your calling. And not only that, but I'm gonna rebuke your descendants. And so not only will you no longer be able to be a priest, set apart by, by God, to be able to uh, connect people to God, pronounce blessings over them, put, do the sacrifices, and, and, and be able to teach. But not only that, but not, not your, your kids won't be able to, your grandkids won't be able to. Why? Because your unfaithfulness today. And that brings up an important thing that we talked about in the Thrive series. If you go back, if you've been with us since November, we, we talked about this idea of family of origin. And how if you looked at your life and you looked at your family, uh, many of us could track some things to our parents, our grandparents, great-grandparents. We could see some of the sin that they had in their lives. And if we tracked it through that, what we would see is that a lot of us are more in the image of our family members than we are in the image of Jesus. Why? Because faithlessness has a reach. Faithlessness has a reach. It doesn't go just to you. Your sin today is not just affecting you. It affects the next generation of your descendants. And so, and so Jesus is saying, hey, I wanna change that. Like a lot of us, like we, we look at that, that family lineage and, and history of sin. And, and a lot of us were like, you know what? I wanna change my family tree. I want things to be different from me below. Amen? I wanna see something different because no matter who you are, parents, you want your kids to be further along in their walk with Jesus than you are, right? You want them to be able to go beyond. You want your ceiling to be their floor. Think about that. I heard somebody talk about that. What if your spiritual ceiling was their floor? Amen. That'd be awesome, right? Setting them up. But some of us, right, are the spiritual ceiling before us was not very high. Not very high. And so God is saying, hey, I want your faithfulness to me today, right now. Because, because there's a lot at stake. Your kids and grandkids won't be able to enjoy the blessing of being a priest in my name because of your unfaithfulness today. And so we could see that. We could like look at our family lineage. We could see how that plays out, practically speaking. Faithfulness today. God is calling us to be faithful today in the midst of a faithless world by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're called to be lighthouses to let people know, hey, this is not the right way. You're getting too close to the rocks. You're towing the line. It's not gonna work out. It's gonna end in destruction. We're called to be God's royal priesthood who says, hey, this is the right way. You're going the wrong way. But the problem was for them is that the priests themselves didn't even get it. The priests themselves didn't even get it. But God, because Jesus came and because he died on the cross and he, and he, and he spilled out his, his, his blood to cover our sin and, and because he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of us, he's paid for all of the cleanliness that we need to have. He's, he's made us clean by his blood. And because he's dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit's dwelling in his believers, we now get to be God's people with God's presence wherever it is we go. We are God's royal priesthood. We are priests in his name, and we are called to be set apart from this faithless world. The New Testament says, shine like stars in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Shine like stars. But in order for us to shine like stars, we have to be faithful to the God who lights us up. It's his light. And we get to be a part of what he is doing. He's calling us to be set apart, to not be giving ourselves over to the problems and the struggles and the sin of this world. He has a vision for us. And, and he shows us in verse five uh, what that vision is like and what it was like for the tribe of Levi when they stepped into this covenant with God. Verse five. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. And I gave these to him. What did he give him? Life and peace. It called for reverence and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth and nothing wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and integrity and turned many from iniquity. 
For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should desire instruction from his mouth because he is the messenger of the Lord of armies. Life and peace. My covenant with him was one of life and peace and I gave these to him. It called for reverence and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. You see, God has given us life and peace and our response to him shows where our heart is on whether or not we're gonna receive that. Life and peace. That sounds so good, right? Life and peace. Life and peace. In the midst of a world that is given over to fear, violence, discord, a virus that's rising, all kinds of things that can get in the way of our life and our peace. But God is saying, I have given you life and peace. So revere me, stand in awe of me. Last week we talked about how we need to restore our sense of awe toward God. Like, are we really seeing him for who he really is? Because if we did, then we'd see that he's such a benevolent, mighty, ferocious God who loves little old me and you. And we can stand in awe of who he is and we can experience life and peace, even in the midst of a world that would never be characterized as one of life and one of peace. Because what do we see? Death and destruction. That's what we see. But we're called to experience something different. You see, if you you look at our culture, if you look at the way we are coping with our sin and with our struggles, what you will see is that the faithless world that is out here, and sometimes it's in our own hearts, uh, we're giving ourselves over to escapism. Like, why, why are we always constantly busy? Why are we always constantly entertained? Why are we always constantly on a screen? Why are we always constantly going, 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 going? Why? Because we're trying to escape the reality of what we know is there if we are still and, and know, knowing that he is God. If we just stop all the problems in our world and our own just individual lives will come right face to face to us. And a lot of people are afraid of what they might find. And so they escape it through working way more or they numb themselves. You know, that's why opioid addiction is so high, drug addiction, alcoholism. All these things are things to just numb ourselves from all of the pain that we experience because this life is full of pain. And a lot of people like, because if this is all that there is, then this is all that there is. And this is terrible, right? If we're honest, some of us are there. And so we've numbed ourselves to everything. Or, or we, you know, we see anxiety rising. We see depression rising. We see loneliness rising. We're in the most advanced society the world has ever known. We've got answers to everything. You got answers in your pocket to everything that you would ever wanna know. And yet it's leaving us wanting to escape, to be numb. We're anxious, we're worried, we're depressed, and we're lonely. But we're not called to be that, church. We're called to be faithful in the midst of a faithless world. And so we don't have to escape. Get this, like when you know that Jesus has overcome the world, when you know that Jesus has overcome your sin, when you know that Jesus is the perfect high priest with the perfect high sacrifice, which was himself, you don't have to escape from the troubles because you know that God is working out all things for good for those who are called according to his purposes and love him. Romans eight twenty eight. you can just check it out. You, you know that he's working even in the midst of a faithless generation. He's working and he's gonna use your faithfulness to bless other people. He's working. While you're busy worrying, he's working. He is at work. And so we don't have to escape the, the troubles of the world. We can be still and know that he is God. We can be still and just know that he's at work. We can rest. We don't have to just go, 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 go. We can rest in his presence and the fact that he has the power and he's already overcome it. He knows what tomorrow holds. We don't have to numb ourselves to things because we, we, we know that this world is full of suffering, but we know that there's a day coming when all that suffering, when all that pain, when all those tears are gonna be thrown in the grave to be no more. Jesus is gonna come back and make all things new. And all the while right now, he is making you new right now. 
And so all the pain, the things that would cause us to try and numb ourselves to, we don't have to numb ourselves to it. We can look at the world in the face. We can look at our own selves in the eye and say, God isn't done with me yet and God isn't done with you yet. We don't have to numb ourselves because when we numb ourselves, we forget how to love. And we are called to love, to be able to look at the problems in this world and know that we have the answer. And his name is Jesus. We don't have to give ourselves over to worrying about tomorrow because Jesus is already there. God already knows what's gonna happen. He's got this. He's got this. We don't have to give ourselves over to just overwhelming sadness because we know the one who is the Prince of Peace. We don't have to go through this life lonely. Why? Because we are the people of God set apart to be his people and we live by the conviction that we are better Together, we're better together. And so we live in community. We are faithful to God in the midst of a faithless generation. If you look at this covenant with Levi, this one of life and peace, it reminds me, I think it's a sign of one thing that was coming and it has come to us today because what did Jesus say to his disciples? The enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life and life abundantly. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the one who came to give us true life, eternal life, and peace, eternal peace. See, we go through stuff, but we don't mourn like those who have no hope. We know who our God is, and we know what he's doing. If you look at verses six and seven, this also reminds me of something that has come. True instruction was in his mouth. This is the priest. This is job description. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me that being God, in peace and integrity and turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should desire instruction from his mouth because he is the messenger of the Lord of armies. All right, now think about that, the role of a priest back then, and think about what Jesus said to his disciples right before he ascended into heaven at the right hand of the throne of the Father and sent his spirit on the day of Pentecost. What did he do? What did he say? Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus said, Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe observe everything I've commanded you and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. So for a priest, true instruction was in his mouth Nothing wrong was found on his lips. He was speaking truth. He was teaching truth. What are we called to do as followers of Jesus? We're called to teach them to observe everything I've commanded as we make them into disciples who are also a part of the royal priesthood. We're training them. What are we called to do? We, he walked with me in peace and integrity. Well, what does Jesus say? And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. I'm walking with you through this. I'm the prince of peace. I'm not gonna leave you alone. I'm right here with you. You are called to do this. Walk with me and do it. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge. What is he called to do? Make disciples. Teach them everything that Jesus has done. You see, the role of a priest back then was to do exactly what we are called to do right now. And that is to make disciples of Jesus, to bring people closer to God through Jesus Christ, to teach them, to baptize them, to bring them into a, the, to the point where they are in a relationship with God forever forever. And so we're called to step into that space. But these priests, even though that they knew what their role was, even though they knew what their job description was, they had it. Maybe it was even on their wall to remind them they had failed. Malachi 2, 8 through 9, you on the other hand have turned from the way. You've caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have violated the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of armies. So I in turn have made you despised and humiliated before all the people because you are not keeping my ways but are showing partiality in your instruction. You, on the other hand, have turned from the way. I've humiliated you. I despised you. I rubbed animal waste on your face. You're the <laughs> butt of the joke. <laughs> Get it? Yeah, that was funny. Oh, I'm gonna file that one on once I shouldn't have said. <laughs> You see, the priests had failed. They had. But our priest, our high priest, hasn't failed. He hasn't failed. 
Remember this, Jesus' faithfulness blesses us today and for eternity. What Jesus did is never gonna turn into a curse. It's always gonna be a blessing. Why? Because he's perfect, perfectly clean. He was sufficient. He was sufficient. And I think what this passage is showing us that not only is Jesus' faithfulness turned into a blessing for us today and for eternity, but also I think God is showing us right now as God's people to be priests who realize and live by this reality that our faithfulness can propel others to Jesus and our faithlessness can repel others from Jesus. Our faithfulness can propel others to Jesus and our faithlessness can repel others from Jesus. What did he say to the priests? If you don't listen to me and take this to heart, have what I'm saying be right in your command center, if the Holy Spirit's not indwelling there and leading that charge in your heart, then you have to understand you're gonna repel people from Jesus rather than propel them to him. That's that's what we see happen, right? Like when, when followers of Jesus don't follow Jesus, then, then people are turned away from Jesus, right? You've probably experienced that in your own life growing up, in, if you grew up in church, right? You've been hurt by a church person. You've, been, you've experienced the unloving presence of someone who professes Christ as Lord. And what did it do? It made you maybe wrestle with your faith. See, church, we have an, a responsibility to to God, to be faithful to him and a responsibility to the people around us to be good witnesses of what it looks like to be a person who is changed by him. Like let's, if if, if you say you're, oh, you follow Jesus, the one who changes your life, he's all powerful, he dealt with me and he's changing me from the inside out and yet you never love anyone. What's that saying about Jesus? That's what people hear. That's what people read when they see you, if that is you. But imagine this, right? If we were the people of God, called by God to be honoring him and being faithful to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. You don't have to like, out of willpower, bring this about in yourself. That's not how this works. God has has paid your debt through Jesus in full. This is not about earning your salvation. That's not at all. We do good works and we love people from our salvation because we are saved and indwelled by the spirit of God. We now can love people in the way that Jesus loved us. Amen? And that's what we are called to do as followers of him. You know, I think what we need to do as we step from this passage and look at that and and examine ourselves, we need to examine our walk because how people view Christians, how oftentimes do people view Christians? And sometimes for good reason, they look at us as judgmental, hypocritical, and ethically no different. Judgmental, hypocritical, ethically no different. I mean, like there's, there's a lot of studies out there that show like people who are part of a church and follow Jesus Like they sin just the same as everyone else. No, there's no difference. And that's not about being perfect. It's just about being different. We're called to be different. Called to be honoring God and and allowing his spirit to work inside of us, right? So we need to open ourselves to that work and and remind ourselves that, hey, we're not high and mighty. We don't just get to pronounce curses on people. We're supposed to pronounce blessings on people, right? We're supposed to honor them the way, we're supposed to honor God in the way that we treat people. We're supposed to love people enough that we tell them the truth and love them enough to tell them the truth in a loving way. Because some of us are good at telling the truth. We're like, mm, boom, 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 boom. And they feel like they got shot by truth bombs or something. A mixed metaphor, whatever. Uh, but we're also called to tell them the truth in a loving way, to be loving through that. Jesus was the perfect embodiment of grace and truth. And as his followers, that's what we're called to do as well. So we need to examine our walk. Look at ourselves in the mirror. Really stay there. Not try and escape it. Not try and grow numb to it. But look at ourselves in the mirror. What, where, where is God needing to work on me? Because guess what? The same is true for me as is true for you. God's not done. He's got more work to do. You are not who you need to be. God is still working. He's still working.
So we're called to be living Christ in our lives. If you've, if you've been in core, uh, you learned that our first core conviction at FCC, at First Church of Christ, is to, is to live as people who are Christ-centered. That we revolve around Christ and what we do and how we do it, what we say and how we say it, how we live and what we do in our lives. We're called to be Christ-centered and so what is, how do we treat that person who, who we, we're supposed to love, but we don't know how to love? Well, we looked at Jesus, right? Because Jesus is the one who loved us enough, even though we were the reason for him receiving spikes in his wrists and his feet and dying a sinful or dying a horrible death to pay for our sin. We, we looked to him because he was the one who said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die for my enemies, of which all of us are. And then he's gonna receive us into the family of God so that we can be called children of God alongside of him. That's good news. But we have to look to Jesus in all this. And, and church, like, think about it. Like, what would it look like to propel others to Jesus with your life? What would it look like to propel others to Jesus rather than repel others from Jesus? Here's the reality. Like, and it's hard for us to like, always remember this. First of all, all of us, uh, I don't know if you knew this, but in the kingdom of God, like if you are uh, you know, approaching retirement age or if you, you're already there or if you know, that's, that's on your mind right now and for those of us who, you know, we've got a little while to go, we should put this in our back pocket and remember it, that there is no retirement in the kingdom of God. It's not gonna, you're not gonna reach one day where he's like, done, go sip a macchiato on the, on the beach, you know, whatever, chill over there, you're done. No, all of us are called to contribute. Uh, the, the pastor I got to serve under for like seven years in Cincinnati, he's gonna be speaking uh, here later this year, uh, but he had this kind of uh, illustration and, and with the whole like, with this passage, this is fitting. Uh, he, he said, you know, a lot of us suffer from spiritual constipation. I know, right? I know. A lot of good stuff's going in. We're like, oh yeah, Bible study, community group, reading my Bible, praying, it's good. It's all good stuff coming in. Sermon, way to go, Brandon. Mm, that's good, yeah. Oh, that's so good. And then we don't serve anyone, and guess what? It's just all kind of up there stuck, <laughs> right? It's not good for us, right? We're called to be blessed and be a blessing. Y'all are like, oh, that's just off chain, Brandon. This is... <laughs> but you get it. Okay, and, and we're called to be blessed by God and be a blessing to others. So if you're not serving on a ministry team, we are missing out and you're gonna have some pain, right? <laughs> Serve people in the name of Jesus. We're all called to be servants of God. Why? Because Jesus came not to be served, but to be a servant, right? And if we're Christ-centered in the way that we live, we're called to take these blessings that we're receiving from God and give them to other people. So, hey, before you leave, connection card, put it in the metal box, right? Serve on a ministry team. We'll start a conversation. We'd love to talk to you so we can solve the spiritual constipation thing, you know? It's not good, you know? And I've got the medicine, <laughs> okay? <laughs> oh, man. Anybody else ready for lunch? <laughs> Last thing, and this is what I just all call us to as we kind of bring this all together and wrap a nice bow on it, is for, we're all called to join God's family and to join God's mission. Join God's family. If you're, if you're here and you've never given your life over to Jesus Christ, you never surrendered to him in faith and trust and repentance and confession and baptism, then, then you can change that. You can just come to him and say, hey, I'm messy and, and join the club because we all are. Look around. It's so all a bunch of messy people who are bought by the blood of Jesus, who came to him humbly knowing that God would accept us because he sent Jesus. And so we join God's family and then we join God's mission. Y'all, he's got such a good thing uh, in mind for us to do. Imagine going to your workplace and to your schools, to the Walmart and Kroger and wherever it is that you go on a weekly and daily basis and being able to be a blessing to people to pronounce blessings over their life. Imagine like you having a conversation with someone you just met and because you are open about your faith, because you're open about the blessings of God, they, they started to pursue Jesus and their life was changed. Imagine being able to have that story be connected to you, just being obedient to what God's saying. 
to be faithful in a faithless generation. People are, are willing to, to hear about God. They're willing to hear about Jesus. We just gotta be willing to put ourselves out there and endure 20 seconds of, of awkwardness and just step out in faith and know that God's gonna meet us there. Like we're called to propel others to Jesus. Imagine what it would look like if, if all of us in FCC at this church in, in Bluffton and Wells County, if you work in Allen County and Huntington County, wherever we go, Adams County, whatever, if we just went to where, wherever we are and we pronounced blessings over people's lives in the name of Jesus and we started to have conversations with them about the awesome God we serve, that'd be amazing, right? It'd be a revival happening. Why? Because we're just doing what it is that God called us to do as his priest, his royal priesthood. Church, we just stand, we're gonna sing and we're gonna worship him. Let's pray.